Hello again everyone from Tokyo Japan and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera. And before I discuss uh, the subject of today's video, this wonderful Canon Pelix camera, I thought I'd share a little bit of information about what is going on in Tokyo right now, uh, which is kind of a big deal in the news. And more specifically, that's what is not going on in Tokyo. And that happens to be the Hanami or Cherry Blossom Viewing Season. Today is uh, Tuesday, March 26, and normally by March 26, we are kind of uh, well into the cherry blossom season here in Tokyo, and the city is full of tourists, uh, and people coming from out of town, not to mention the locals and uh, office workers and all that who are going out to have cherry blossom uh, picnics in the different parks around the city. Uh, there are no cherry blossoms. And uh, this is a, a huge disappointment to so many people who uh, plan trips and excursions, and not to mention the foreign tourists who come from overseas to see Tokyo and Japan during the cherry blossom season. Uh, this morning, I went out early to walk my dog through the park, uh, Hinokicho Park across the street, and now the 60 or so cherry trees they have there, I counted maybe five cherry blossoms. And uh, five is better than nothing, but five isn't the kind of uh, number of blossoms that anyone is going to go and have a picnic underneath. And uh, but what that means, that though they have started, there are five blossoms today. That means we'll have a fair amount by this weekend, and by the following weekend, uh, we should be well into the peak season. Uh, it's a kind of difficult thing when the cherry blossom season doesn't arrive when it's supposed to, according to all the old timers and uh, those who are supposed to be very good at predicting the cherry blossom season. Uh, the official figure was supposed to uh, be March 18th, which was more than a week ago. So all these people are kind of, uh, everyone is kind of looking at them angrily and saying, you know, you can't find your own backside with two hands and a flashlight, let alone predict when the cherry blossoms are going to bloom. But uh, now that they've started blooming, uh, it's a pretty sure thing to know how the rest of the season is going. And as I said, in about 10 days or so, we should be in the peak of this season. So let's go ahead and get started with the subject of today's video and probably what most of you want to hear about rather than cherry trees and cherry blossoms. And that is going to be this really cool camera here. This is the Canon Pelix from 1965. And this is the camera which has the distinction of being Canon's first TTL or TTL camera. Uh, TTL stands for through the lens. And uh, of course, any SLR camera, you focus in a TTL system through the lens. But uh, this camera featured uh, a wonderful new light meter system. At least it was new for Canon, <clears throat> which allowed you to get a, a light reading through the lens of the camera and give you a much more uh, accurate exposure. And this camera featured a, another uh, new innovation or maybe an old ovation, I don't know what you would call it, but uh, Canon thought it was new. And that was the ad addition of a uh, SLR mirror which didn't move when the camera was operated. So this camera uh, featured two wonderful new uh, technologies and uh, Canon went to a lot of trouble to produce, market, and sell this camera. And unfortunately, it kind of just it died. It died on the died on the tree. No one was really interested in this camera. The tech in this camera is already old when Canon started designing it. Uh, Pentax had already uh, had a wonderful TTL uh, kind of camera with their Spotmatic, and other makers were coming up with much more advanced systems. And uh, if if nothing else, at least this camera gave uh, Canon a chance to experiment experiment with the production of new technologies. And Canon in those days uh, was not afraid to experiment. If you've seen some of the oddball cameras which they produced in uh, you know, in the 60s, the the Canon flex cameras, the the ones with the trigger winding system on the bottom and removable prisms and all this kind of stuff, they weren't afraid to take risks. And their goal in those days was, of course, to climb to the top of the market, which at that time was uh, dominated by Nikon or Nikon or Nikon, depending on how you like to pronounce it. And uh, uh, it took a long time for uh, Canon eventually uh, got to the top of the ladder, which uh, they did uh, uh, when they got into the digital era. But in, in the mid-1960s, they were still struggling really hard. So let's go ahead and take a look at the features, controls, and functions of the Canon Pelix. And we'll go ahead and start on the top of the camera. And this looks very much like a typical SLR made by a bunch of makers of that period and pretty much operates the same way that most uh, similar SLR cameras would, uh, 
would function with a few minor differences. And I'll go ahead and point those out. But first I'll go ahead and start with the usual stop, stop, start, you know, to start at the usual place. And I'll start with the, this wonderful pop out uh, film rewind knob, which pops out like so, but doesn't actually open the film door on the back. To do that, you have to operate a second thing on the bottom here. This is a key which you turn and it kind of unlocks the bottom similar to the way the Canon flex cameras work or the earlier uh, Canon 7 and Canon P uh, rangefinder cameras operate. Below the film rewind knob, we have a kind of selector switch here with three settings. We have a black flag setting, a white flag setting, and a C setting. Uh, the C is for the battery check settings. So what you have to do is set the uh, uh, shutter speed to uh, the, the correct setting and set the film speed to ISO 100 and simply turn this to the C setting and look through the viewfinder and if the check needle lines up with the round mark it means that you uh, have adequately charged battery. The battery is installed here on the left side and this camera uses the old MR9 Mercury batteries but you can use LR44 batteries with an adapter or of course you can just simply put in a wind cell which will give you the correct voltage without needing any adapter or anything like that. Uh, the next setting is the standard setting, the white flag setting, that's what you use in most cases when you are operating the camera. And then for uh, uh, to, there, there's an odd setting here, this black flag setting and what this does is seal off uh, the viewfinder in the back and I'm not sure what is the purpose for this on other cameras shutting off the the light through the viewfinder uh, this allows reduces errant light from getting in and affecting the exposure inside the camera but since you actually have to look through the viewfinder in order to set the exposure uh, I don't understand what this is for it's some kind of oddball thing maybe they had planned to uh, uh, incorporate other features into this camera or the, you know, there was a, a, a change in the design of the camera everywhere else except for here. I have no idea why this is set up like this but it is and so um, if you want to have a camera where you can't look through the viewfinder just set it to the black setting and this camera will do that. We have a shoe for mounting a flash gun here and uh, when you are operating a flash you have to uh, plug in uh, to the PC PC sync socket here on the front. Uh, you can use a vintage bulb flash, a vintage strobe flash, or a modern flash with this camera just by following the directions on or settings on your more modern flash. Over here we have a very conventional and ordinary uh, shutter speed dial with a full range of speeds from bulb in one second up to one one thousandth of a second. And there's an X sync speed which you would select when you're using the flash. And uh, of course, since it's a manual camera, uh, there are more options available when using the flash. Pretty much anything uh, under 1 60th and below you can use uh, the flash with. Uh, by lifting up on the shutter speed dial, you can change the film speed. Uh, very simple and easy to do and very much like uh, modern cameras. And even modern, some modern digital cameras have the same system. We have the shutter release button here with a convenient locking ring around it to prevent you from accidentally firing the shutter if it's cocked. And the shutter release button accepts a standard cable release. And of course here we have the film winding and shutter charging lever and we have the film counter dial underneath. On the back of the camera we have the viewfinder and this has a dovetails around the base here. It's a large opening which makes it uh, easier to use if you wear glasses. You can attach an eye cup here and uh, Canon made a waist level finder and a uh, eye cups for this camera. Uh, odd accessories which no one actually ever bought. Uh, there's a cool thing here, this cap, if you remove this, there's an adjustment for uh, the light meter. So you can adjust the light meter for accuracy, and I believe you can adjust it enough where if you're using a more modern one and a half volt battery, you can adjust the uh, light meter in this camera mechanically uh, to be able to give you a correct uh, light meter reading. On the bottom of the camera here, we have the uh, key which I showed earlier, uh, which you use to open the film back. You have a standard quarter inch tripod socket, and you have the release button here, which you depress to uh, unlock the winding mechanism so you can rewind the film. On the front of the camera, we have a couple of odd features. We have a kind of thing here which looks like a self timer lever, but there are actually three different controls here. We have a self timer system, and to operate that, you would pull it all the way around to the right here. Uh, when you move it the opposite way, 
that turns on the CDS light meter and moves the photo cell for the light meter uh, in front of the shutter curtains and allows you to take a, a light meter reading. I'll go ahead and remove the lens and you can see how that works. And I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this camera uh, has a, uh, a fixed mirror, uh, unlike other SLR cameras. When I take a photograph, you can see the shutter curtains move and you can see when I'm winding, you can see the shutter curtains move. But when I fire there, there's no motion of the, the mirror. There's no vertical motion. Uh, this camera uses a semi-transparent mirror, which is fixed in place and allows enough light to get through the mirror to uh, expose the film and uh, hit the light meter, but also allowing enough of a reflection of what the lens sees to go through the prism and be visible with your eye. It's a really odd system, but uh, one thing, it, it did solve a couple of problems. First, um, uh, it made the TTL system easier to work because uh, there was no mirror mechanism to interfere with the TTL mechanism. And second, uh, uh, it, it simplified the construction of the camera. The reflex mirror system on a camera is a very, I guess, complicated and complex piece of machinery, which has to be very precisely timed to work with the shutter. So it has to open up completely, the shutter has to go through its cycle, and then it has to close completely, and do this very quickly and be able to do it tens of thousands of times. And by removing this mechanism uh, from the camera, the camera should be a much more reliable, uh, simpler, and easier to use device requiring less maintenance. And also, the camera would have less vibration because there's no reflex mirror bouncing up or down. And it should be quieter, but uh, unfortunately, uh, that's not the case <laughs> with this camera. It sounds just as loud as any other uh, mid-60s uh, Canon uh, single lens reflex camera. Now, the way the light meter system works is as I push the lever here, you can see the light meter cell popping up in the middle of the film plane in the back. And also you can see this lever moving on the bottom back and forth. And what that does is, is it stops down the aperture on the lens and uh, allows the amount of light which is actually going to be, uh, I guess, projected onto the film. So it's kind of a complicated system when you are using uh, a manual uh, light meter actuating lever, having to operate the shutter speed dial as well as operating the aperture. And you, you have to use these three controls in combination in order to get uh, the correct exposure. Now, basically what Canon recommends is just choose the minimum uh, shutter speed, which you are most comfortable with. And uh, most people don't want to go below 1 60th of a second. And if you want to do something which uh, freezes action, maybe 1 250th or 1 500th of a second, and simply leave it there. And what you would do is uh, with the lens on the camera, you would simply adjust the aperture with the exposure uh, lever pushed over and you turn the aperture until the light meter needle lines up with the circular uh, alignment mark on the right side of the viewfinder. And in order to make this a little bit easier, they put a locking lever here, which will allow you to lock the CDS uh, uh, lever in place and free up your hand a little bit. So you can actually adjust the shutter speed level and the aperture uh, in combination. And you simply click it over to the left and that releases it and that un that uh, opens the aperture and allows you to get more light for focusing and composition. That's a kind of tricky system and uh, and something which was replaced very with just a simple built-in system where you like in the uh, Nikon and other cameras you simply open the widening switch from its lock position and that switches on the light meter and it switches off when you push it back like this when you put it in the case or when it bumps against you when you're carrying the camera on a strap. Uh, why Canon went with this feature I have no idea but that was one of the things which uh, was uh, uh, I guess a, a major mistake in the designing of this camera. They could have done a much better job than that. Uh, but to be fair to Canon, a lot of people in those days were used to handheld light meters and even more complicated ways of uh, reading the light. Some of them used light meter cards, which aren't ex which aren't any kind of uh, thing other than just uh, uh, a card made out of celluloid, which uh, shows a list of uh, film speed values and a list of lighting conditions and a list of recommended uh, uh, 
I guess, uh, exposure value numbers, which are translated into aperture and shutter speeds. And using this card, you would be able to compute just by looking at the, the, the light around you, a, a fairly accurate uh, system. So this was much more highly advanced than that, but it was ob already obviously compared to what other makers were introducing in the market and which some had already put on the market. Uh, of course, there were other cameras like uh, the Pintax uh, Spotmatic had a, uh, a meter lever on the left side, which would push up in order to uh, turn on the light meter. But uh, as I said, all this was much simplified. And other ones after that, you know, of course, more modern ones, like you can hold the camera up to your eye and it switches on the light meter and then it switches it off as soon as you move your eye away. But uh, yeah, th this camera did accomplish a few things. First, uh, Canon was able to say that they actually produced a TTL camera. Uh, they were able to see how well uh, this uh, pellicle mirror system worked, and they, they got a pretty good idea of how not to make and sell a camera. Now, uh, when I was looking at the manual for this camera, I w it was interesting to see how the light meter worked. It is a center-weighted spot meter kind of system like you would see on the uh, the Pentax uh, Spotmatic. And this allows for pretty good exposures once you get used to this kind of system. Now, spot meters are a really wonderful way for getting a really accurate exposure. And they're really wonderful when you are shooting uh, for uh, scenes where, you know, there's a lot of darkness in them. I, the old saying was when you were taking photographs, kind of exposed for the shadows. So take your light meter reading off of the darker area, and that will give you a, a better uh, or at least more usable photograph than metering off the light area. And in Canon's instructions to get a well-balanced uh, uh, photograph in high contrast situations, they recommend you meter on a dark spot and a light spot and kind of average between them. So, you know, you when you go to a dark spot, it, say, it recommends, say, uh, f2.8, and then you go to uh, a brighter spot and it says f8, so just set it to around 4.5 or 5.6, and that should give you a good uh, average uh, light meter reading where you get, you know, you can see stuff in the shadows and that the light stuff isn't too overexposed. Uh, the camera is kind of interesting that it has a few of the old features from the like Canon rangefinder cameras. It has the stainless steel shutter curtains, uh, which uh, like in the, the rangefinder cameras, you can kind of see here, maybe there's some wrinkles on the shutter curtains, uh, mainly from uh, people not putting in the film, carefully touching the shutter curtains. The wrinkles don't make any difference uh, in the operation of the camera. Things you have to look out for with the Pelex camera. First, make sure that the shutter works. Uh, sometimes there's some lag between when you actually push the shutter button and the time that the, the camera shutter actually operates, and that's due to a dirty mechanism. Another issue these cameras have is with, of course, the light meter. This is uh, a 1960s tech with 1960s quality wiring and, and metal and stuff like that, and uh, if the camera isn't stored carefully, you can have issues with it. Uh, the batteries in these cameras, the mercury batteries, were prone to uh, gassing inside and the gas is corrosive and can cause damage to the inside of the camera. So if you're buying one, make sure that the battery uh, chamber is clean. It doesn't have any of that green, nasty corrosion in it. Another problem with these cameras have is uh, deterioration of the Pinta prism. And like the other cameras, they used a kind of uh, foam uh, to protect from shocks and to uh, install the prism inside the camera and unfortunately the chemicals in this foam break down and etch into the glass around the prism and can damage the uh, reflective coating and prisms for these cameras are, are kind of hard to find. On the other hand, uh, you know, there are enough of these cameras around on the market and they're quite cheap that uh, if you can find, if you have one which works well but has a crappy prism. You can probably find one which has a good prism, but uh, doesn't work otherwise, and just you know swap the prism from the good camera into, or the bad, which, well, neither one is good, but the worst camera into the better camera. And then you have something which has a pretty uh, uh, clear field of view. Uh, these cameras could all benefit from a good cleaning and lubricating to get the shutter speeds up to snuff. Uh, the shutter speeds are fairly reliable with the exception of the 1000th speed. So uh, if you're taking a look at one of these cameras, take off the lens, set to 1 1000th, point the camera at something bright with the film door open, and just look through and make sure that you can get a, a brief glimpse of the light coming through the camera, and that'll show you that the 1 1000th speed is at least working. It may not be super accurate, but as you can see it at all, it's usually close enough uh, to get an exposure with. But anyway, uh, that's it for my view, review of the uh, Canon Pelix camera. 
Uh, there are quite a few of these you can find uh, there. I see them fairly often here. They weren't, as I said, they weren't a very uh, successful seller for the Canon company. I think they sold most of them at a loss, just trying to get them off the shelves. Uh, some black uh, paint models were made, uh, and uh, they're they're kind of uncommon. They're not very rare, but they're worth more than the silver painted ones. And this camera is fitted with a Canomatic lens, which isn't the correct camera. It can work with this lens, but uh, Canon recommends that you use the FL lenses with this type. Uh, the camera uh, manual, if you look online, you can find the manual for this camera and it will show you how to use uh, the light meter with uh, all the different types of Canon lenses which were available at the time. But uh, that's it for this video. Uh, I'm planning to do some more videos. I'm still doing videos on my uh, cycling channel and I'm planning to do a, a cherry blossom ride around Tokyo and uh, ride my bike through the more, uh, I guess, scenic cherry blossom areas. So uh, if you'd like to see these videos, check out my cycling channel. I'll post a link to that channel in the description below the video. And hopefully next week I will have another camera video up as well. I just got a really interesting Horseman medium format camera, which uh, a lot of uh, press camera fans might be interested in seeing. And I've got a few more things lined up after that. So if you'd uh, like to check those out, uh, uh, please come back or subscribe. And if you uh, like the video, uh, please uh, click the like button. That helps. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and I hope you tune in again soon.